you know what, I'm going to try 100 ideas. Maybe 95 of them will be terrible. That's okay. Five of them could be real killer ideas and one of them might be the next juggernaut hit. Allowing people that space to make mistakes, but also to think outside the box and to really push the envelope. That's absolutely critical. Welcome to the I Own It podcast with Ben Reinberg. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. We are live from Laguna Beach, California, in the Ben Reinberg I Own It studios today. And I'm really excited to speak to our guest coming on shortly. Just an incredible entrepreneur. I mean, I will just basically blanket that statement because that's really who he, what he is, no matter what he does in life. And so, James Burstall, thank you so much for joining us this morning on a Friday. It's great to see you and uh, look forward to chatting with you today. It's great to see you. I love Laguna Beach, so I'm delighted to be with you in spirit over there. Wow. Well, hopefully you're enjoying Spain and you're going to get some good weather this weekend. Yeah. I'm so the shit, so all is good. <laughs> so you recently launched your new book uh, that I wanted to discuss with you, The Flexible Method, Prepare to Prosper in the Next Global Crisis. Um, by the way, congratulations. Uh, it yeah. is so relevant to me as I am um, an icon in commercial real estate. I've been in commercial real estate, James, for almost three decades. And when I think of this title in this book, and I see what's going on in our market and the world and what's coming about with trillions of dollars of loans coming due, I can't even imagine what 2024 is going to look like coming up. But let's kick things off. Share your story as a business leader and the insights you applied of not only surviving, but thriving during the 08 financial crisis and COVID. Well, the book is actually, despite what you might think, a very positive book. I am no doom monger. I actually think that crises, although they are painful, and I have my war wounds, we all do. We all remember just most recently how horrendous COVID was. But the truth is, if we use crises wisely, we can learn so much. And the one thing, I mean, I learned many things in COVID, but I think the one really strong, most strong thing that came through for me is that when you put your people first, your team will do incredible things to help you. And in business, we need our people. You know, business is not a PL, it's not about nickels and dimes, although money is very important. I respect money. But business is about individual relationships and it's a community of folks who help each other. And COVID was just one example, and the book is very broad-ranging. I interview a whole range of leaders from different industries, and we look at crises from 9-11 all the way up to the present day. And we have many crises right now. We've got Ukraine, we've got the inflationary crisis, and many, many others. In fact, we live in a time of perma-crisis. It's not one after the other. It's multi-simultaneous crises. So how on earth do we as business leaders and just humans and members of families, how do we, how do we cope with all this kind of craziness? I think it's interesting now that in academia, in universities and colleges around the world, they're now talking about learning to deal with a world of strangeness. The world is weird. The world is full of crazy stuff that happens over which, practically, we have very little control. And we, as people who survive and thrive, have to learn to navigate with the concept that we don't have the answers for everything. But there are lots of answers for lots of different things if we are willing to listen be humble, gather our people around us and take tough decisions. You know, I love that because I look at my company, Alliance Consolidated, and I think about some of the changes we've had to make in this environment. You know, we, we have this hybrid, we have this remote work, James, that people are dealing with as employers like yourself and all of us. And it can be challenging at times. What we did, which I thought was interesting, is we became a people first initiative company. And so what we decided to do is we hired a human behaviorist and we brought her in because we we're trying to figure out, we saw for years, we saw the personal life and the business life were intertwined. And we said, how do we deal with folks to provide longevity, consistency? Because we were seeing the younger generation, we'd see the resumes and we'd see all this job hopping. And I said, how do we prevent this from happening? What can we do to change the game? So we said, okay, well, let's look at and have everyone do what we call a life book and understand who they are as a person. And then once we understand that, we started looking at our leadership team and everyone, everyone wants mentoring and coaching. 
Everyone wants to learn about investing because that's what we do as a company. People want to learn about health and wellness. So what was interesting is we had to shift gears and figure out how do we accommodate all these. And so the personal and the business have become a game changer in this environment because that's what people want. And it used to be in the past, like, don't get into people's personal and business. Don't have them share who they really are. And now it's different. Now you have to kind of get in the weeds a little bit and, and ask questions and find out what's going on. Because what ends up happening is people's personal lives will get involved in the business and business will flow into their personal life. And so we've learned that the hard way of we have to step up and, and change the way we do business. One of the chapters in my book is called um, Calm, Purposeful Leadership. And that authenticity, especially now in the time of AI, you know, we are surrounded by weird, robotically generated technological stuff. And we don't know half the time whether it's real or not. And I'm excited about AI, to be honest. In my industry, I work in the film and television sector. We are starting to use AI, obviously, for distribution and monetization. That's a done deal. We do a lot of computer CGI, computer graphic and imaging. That has been using AI for a long time. But increasingly, we're starting to use it for ideation. Now... I'm excited about it because it's a great tool for creativity and for running businesses. But we also need to make sure we retain emotional intelligence as human beings. We need to take responsibility for how we manage the AI. So as we go forward, we're going to start, I think, to really lean on our humanity and seek out that authenticity. So I don't think that human beings are going to be obliterated by AI. I think, if anything, that AI is going to make us even more important because we must speak our truth. Now, I do have a boundary i don't believe in oversharing and for example during covid there were times when i felt really down you know it was tough it was frightening i was frightened about my elderly parents i was frightened about my kids i was frightened about family and friends who were struggling of course it was scary but at the same time i had to acknowledge that i've got a big team of people we have we're based in london Liverpool, Glasgow, New York, and Los Angeles. And we make a lot of big shows for the television stations and networks and platforms all across the planet. We also have a lot of people in their 20s who, during COVID, were sitting in their rented apartments with not very good Wi-Fi connectivity. And they were fearful. Our job as, as leadership, not to stand up and go, you know, boosterism, everything's going to be fine, because it wasn't going to be fine. And we didn't have all the answers. But it was critically important to say, listen, I'm here for you. And I started writing daily emails to people from day one, the moment we went into lockdown in the US and the UK. And I said to people every day, I don't have all the answers, nor do the management team, but we are working together. Communication is excellent. And we will seek and find the answers together with you. And we did. And we went out and we found exactly how to find our way through. And we set up the very detailed COVID protocols. And we were the first big show out of the gate with the show called The Masked Singer, which, you know, on Fox in the US, it's on ITV in the UK. It's a giant entertainment format. But there was no way you could film that with a studio. There was zero studio audience. Our, our you know, big celebrity panel, they were performing in masks to a darkened room with one camera operator in a mask. I mean, that's not a great environment to do a, a comedic singing and dancing show. But it worked really well because everybody rolled up their sleeves and said, this is weird, but we're going to make it work. We were also first out of the gate with a big scripted series. We made a big drama series for the BBC. Everybody said, you're not going to shoot any drama in 2020. And we were like, of course we are. We don't have that option. We employ thousands of freelancers. We're not going to let those people go hungry. We're going to have to set up COVID protocols and make it work. And we did that and we worked with our team. We were very authentic. We were very honest. We said, this is going to be tough, but we as a team will find the way, we'll set up the method to do it. And that, and, and we did. So James, I believe many executives dread tough conversations and tough decisions and are often hesitant to embrace change. Um, would you agree with that principle? And do you believe that your book may help open up minds on embracing new possibilities when facing challenging situations. I know as an employer, I am faced every single moment and day of challenging decisions. I wake up and there's a challenge ahead of me that I got to solve. Tell me about, would you agree with embracing change and how do you deal with it? I think the time of top-down leadership where the boss is supposed to know everything and then tell everybody what to do is just long gone. That is no longer fit for purpose. In my world, what I did actually, for example, during COVID is I 
brought five of my best people around me from operations, from finance, from communications, from IT. And these are not yes people. These are really strong minds who are frankly much better at their job than I am. I couldn't possibly do their job. (laughs) And I brought them into what we call a COBRA group, which is a term that's used in the UK when there's an emergency. So COBRA group is for like a, a fast response emergency team. And these people told me stuff that I did not want to hear. It was painful. But I wasn't surprised what I was hearing, but I knew they were right. And it helped me actually feel I was not alone. I had five very strong generals around me. I call the chapter, gather your generals. And they told me stuff I didn't want to hear. And I would go away and think about it. And I'd be like scratching my head and thinking, oh my God, really? Are we just going to, are we really going to have to do this? And then, Perhaps I'd talk to them a little bit more and then we get together and we go, okay, we're going to make a tough decision now. And you know what? When you make that tough decision, you have to follow it through with fierce resolve. When you as a team decide the path, you get on that path and you follow it through and you will not let anything get in your way. I love that. That's that's so well said. And it's so true as a leader. You know, James, I love the saying, if you want to become an expert on a topic, write a book about it. <laughs> And as you were writing the book and researching examples in other industries, tell me, did you have interesting insights you had on change leadership that you hadn't considered before? Okay. I mean, I met some incredible people. and I'm a journalist by training. I started out working for Vanity Fair and and on the last traveler and some of those other big titles. And then I worked in newspapers. So I I always like asking questions and listening and learning. I'm, I'm a permanent student. I met some very inspiring people. I have to say one of the most inspiring people I met is the youngest mayor in the U.S. called David Holt. He's also the first Native American mayor in Oklahoma City. And he's a Republican. He's not particularly a Trump supporter, but he's a Republican. And, of course, Oklahoma State had a governor who wasn't particularly willing to acknowledge that COVID even existed, frankly. Um, But David Holt felt strongly that his he has quite a diverse population. It's a very growing city. It's quite an interesting young city. There's a lot of people moving from coasts, as you know, into Oklahoma City. So it's got quite a big tech industry that's sparking up. And he said, you know what? I've got people to protect. So I'm going to go counter to what others are saying. And I'm going to put um, sheltering at home. I'm going to shut down bars and restaurants and clubs. I'm going to put down a lockdown. And he made a number of very important speeches at the time saying that not everybody's going to agree with me with this, but I feel a personal responsibility to my people who put me in this position. And I mean, it's a terrible thing to have to say, but the fatality rates tell the story. In Oklahoma City, they had extremely low fatality rates during COVID because the people were protected. In Oklahoma State, the numbers were much higher because people were protected in a different way, maybe not so much. And the truth of the matter is David Holt said, I will be judged on my performance. And they went to an election some months later and he won again by a landslide. People wanted to be protected and he put these very strong measures in place. And, and, the, and as like I say, you know, they had, they had a, a more positive outcome than I, I think they probably would have done had they gone a different route. So I was impressed by this man who was willing to go actually counter to what a lot of Republicans were saying. And certainly what Donald Trump was saying at the time and saying, you know what, I think differently. And he was a man of his own volition in his position of power who made a choice and, and the proof was in the, in the outcome. So let's, let's talk about the title of the book, Flexible Method. Were there other names you were considering? I mean, why Flexible Method? I work in in journalism, as I said, and I spent my life thinking about titles. It's very, very difficult to find one. For starters, you've got to have a .com. That is absolutely critical. And a .org or a .net is just not, in my opinion, as good. Now, there are not many .coms left. Most of them have been bought by Malaysian or Chinese entrepreneurs, and you can only pick them up for, excuse me, for tens and tens of thousands of dollars, which I didn't want to do. So that was one advantage. Um, next up, flexibility is just the key to the, to, to, it's in our DNA. And actually, the reason I, you know, I work in the entertainment industry. Why on earth would an entertainment group producer be somebody credible to write about a risk management book? Well, the truth of the matter is my sector is incredibly flexible. We are 
used to working on tight margins. We think in an agile way. When something doesn't work, we pivot and come up with something different. And actually, many bigger organizations would do well to pick up some of that DNA because if you are brittle and you break in the wind, you will die. Whereas if you're flexible and you're willing to change tack and you're willing to listen to stuff maybe you don't want to hear and go, you know what? Her idea is better than my idea. I'm going to do that. Then you will come out stronger and fitter. So that's the flexibility piece. Methodology is I wanted the book to be purposeful. When we went into COVID, there was no manual out there. There was no guidebook. We were kind of feeling around in the dark. Like how on earth are we going to find our way through this? How can we get our people back to work? In my sector, we were told for 12 months, there'd be no production. And if you're not producing, we have no income. So we were faced with complete wipeout. I mean, it was an existential threat to our industry. So what do we do? Well, you have to think outside the box, come up with solutions and come up with a very clear strategy. And I've outlined that as 16 lessons in the book, which are completely applicable across all industries. And I've, and I've, I've interviewed leaders across hospitality, finance, politics, medicine, farming in, in the Carolinas, and many, many other sectors. All of us were faced with existential threats of different kinds. And many of these people I discovered were themselves using a flexible method, which I then was able to identify and put into the book. And I wrote the book to be purposeful. And I have been getting fantastic feedback. The book hit number one in a number of listings on Amazon in the US and Amazon in the UK. So it's really getting traction, which I'm obviously delighted about. And I hope it will be there for the next generation. So when the next really huge thing comes along and throws us all off kilter, there will at least be one book out there where, pe where people will say, well, look, there's a book out there. There's 16 lessons. They're not easy but they do work. So let's apply that and let's evolve it. And it's an ongoing process. The reason I went with the publisher, Ashet, who are huge, as you know, in both Boston and in London, a big international publisher, they like books which have long shelf life that people can keep adding to and we can keep evolving it and improving it. So the flexible method is something which in itself is flexible. It will grow and develop and get more refined as the years go by. You know, one thing I like about the book exactly is is those different steps. And I encourage anyone that's a business owner, entrepreneur, to it's a good read. So um, your company, Argonine, includes nine labels. And what were the steps that you took to build up your portfolio? A lot of our audience want to know, like, how did you grow? And what were some of your biggest acquisitions? Well, one of the biggest things for me is building, accruing uh, expertise over many years. So I did work as a journalist and I worked for 10 different bosses. Um, in 10 different companies, including the BBC and other independent production companies. And every time I worked for a different company, I learned something. And sometimes they were great experiences and sometimes they were difficult experiences. And actually often the difficult experiences were the most useful because I, I realized how not to do business. Um, and one thing I realized in one company that I worked for, for example, is they had that kind of... Um, top-down leadership mentality where they were thrilled and excited and felt great if they basically, excuse my uh, English, if they screwed the opposition and they went rubbing their hands in glee. It's like, oh, we messed them up. We messed them around and we got, we came out top dog. Now those people will never come back. That's not a sustainable client relationship. So I realized that, you know, all business deals have got to be win-win. You've got to make sure that when you come out of it, you feel great and they feel great. And then they're going to want to come back and do more business. So I picked up lots of skills on the job. I also did everything. You know, I'm quite a humble guy. I started out making co coffee and answering telephones for other people's companies. And I met a whole bunch of people and they realized that I knew how to make a good cup of coffee. So they said, can you go and do the photocopying? <laughs> And uh, I was good at photocopying. So they said, well, maybe you could do a bit of research. So I did a bit of research and so on. So actually, in my company, every single job that everybody does, I could do myself. And that is a huge advantage. That's not to say I would do as well as them. And it's not to say necessarily I want to do all those jobs any longer because I have done them in the past. But I do know what it's like. So I have a lot of emotional intelligence based on experience about what it really feels like to be under doing a tough deadline being on camera. I know I, I was on camera myself at the beginning of my career. I know that when you're on camera, you are very exposed. So I understand what it's like to be an A-list performer who comes out every day 
and they're revealing themselves and the show may be great or it might be a complete bomb and they're the ones that are going to take the blame so i get it i understand what that feels like now i was never an a-list performer but nonetheless i had my own experience of it and that really helped so i do think that that on building up a big range of expertise through by by going through it yourself is is enormously helpful then in terms of the actual build well i set up my own company in 2001 i was in my mid-30s i knew the only way to make money in my sector was not to be an employee but to be a boss and um i did get some backing from from a company at the time who were very well respected at both the discovery in the us and the bbc in the uk and i did a two-year deal with them and we agreed that if i paid everything back within two years i could go completely solo which i did they said you'll never do it but i did it in 18 months so becoming 100 independent 18 months in was a great place to be then i just built the company on on bricks and mortar if you like um selling great shows making their shows hugely successful we brought a bunch of formats into the US from the UK. Uh, so, you know, the, the money in my industry is in intellectual property. So a show, we, we, in fact, that one of the shows that made us was called Cash in the Attic, um, which is a huge hit on BBC. We sold it to 167 countries around the world. And then I had heard of a small channel in, in 2002 called HGTV based in Tennessee. And I was like, well, it's called HGTV. It's kind of home and garden. That sounds interesting. They're based in Tennessee. I've never been there yet. I'll get, let me jump on a plane. I went and visited them and they were like, who's this British producer coming in? And I said, well, you know, we've got a hit show on the BBC. Would you be interested? And they said at the time, well, you know, we're growing. We've got, you know, high hopes for this network. Um, but we feel a little bit beige. Everything's a bit kind of in that mid-brown tone. And we'd like things to be really kind of colourful and more varied and more dynamic and more diverse. Would you consider setting up in New York in the tri-state area? So I said, well, yeah, of course. I've got family in New York. My sister lives there. And um, film everything in New York. So you're going to get a really diverse cross-section of American people and a really kind of different range of properties and different range of artifacts. It's a show all about making money out of stuff that's stuck in your attic and you've forgotten about. And it became a huge hit. So on the back of that, we were able to then start building incrementally. We then set up. In fact, I'll tell you one thing that we did do, which you'd be interested in. So we bought a commercial property in Manhattan. Oh, wow. It was, actually, it was a brownstone. Okay. And this would have been about 2005. And that transformed the business because suddenly, for my American clients, and we're 50-50 US, 50 UK. Mm -hmm. My American clients were like, James, you're here to stay. You're not just a kind of resident alien visiting you actually you're putting down roots. And it was a lovely old brownstone on 26 and Park in, 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 in Madison um, uh, Park Garden, um, Madison uh, Square Park area. Um, it transformed the business because I think suddenly we had a front door that my clients who were all in Midtown, they could, you know, if stuff happened or they wanted to talk to us or, you know, they just felt they can come and knock on the door and come and visit and have, grab a cup of coffee. And by putting down those roots, it did two things. One, it made our clients feel that we were here and we were here to stay. Uh, and two, of course, it was a great investment. And one thing that I have always done in my business is um, I've always tried to avoid renting. I don't particularly want to pay somebody else. And you can get mortgages. You can get com commercial mortgages. I mean, I know your story well. And of course, over the years, you've always gone to the bank and said, will you help me? And banks believe you if you have a credible story. And the black banks, believe, the American bank, believed me at that opportunity. And I did the same in the UK. Um, and I bought various properties over the years. And I would buy the big, these properties at the beginning, but always and only for the business itself. And I think, oh, my goodness, what have I done? I've bought this absolute giant, giant space and been never going to fill it. And my heart would be going, bum, 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 you know, as you look at this vast empty atrium, you think, how can we fill it with people and, you know, programs? But, of course, we always have done, you know, thank goodness, and let's hope it continues that way. Um, but there's nothing like having your own bricks and mortar because then you can create your own space. You can create a sense of belonging. You can put your own art up on the walls. Um, for me, from uh, going back to our people point, you've got to have a great kitchen. It's the single most important building uh, room in a building. It's the, 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 the total democracy in the kitchen. I go to the kitchen every day and I make myself a coffee or a bagel. And I meet the receptionist. I meet the producer doing this. I meet the freelancer who's coming doing that. And we chat about stuff. It could be important stuff or it could be something we read in the news or what did you have for dinner last night? It doesn't really matter. But there's that interaction, that people stuff. 
And you know what? I did do some study at, Sc- at Stanford at the, at the grad school. And one, I came out with a lot. Of, uh, one, I learned how to do a plank, a really great plank. I know you love your fitness. So do I. So Stanford gave me a great plank. <laughs> And then they also said to, taught me that the single most important room in your entire enterprise is the kitchen. So very practical advice from that venerable institution. <laughs> well, what's interesting in an office, Bill, I'll give you another insight as well. The, the kitchen is important in office space. There's no question because people want, I'm a big tea drinker. You know, you would think I'm British. I'm big into tea. I don't do caffeine and or coffee, but you know, our staff and other staffs around the country want that nice kitchen. In an office building, one of the number one features that people focus on, James, is the woman's bathroom. If you go into any nice office building and you go into the woman's bathroom, you know it's a nice building. It's well upkeep. There's some secrets of when you're in due diligence and you're looking at a building, you go right into the woman's bathroom. <laughs> I, people think I'm crazy. They're like, what are you doing? Go in the woman's bathroom. I'm like, I want to see what how this landlord treats the building. And you walk in and usually it's the it's the floor to ceiling mirror. It's the flowers in the bathroom. It's the nice vanity mirror. It's all these little things go a long way. And it's some of the keys. It's like on residential and I'm not into residential, but if you ever walk into a big development, one of the things that they do is the first thing the woman does, you know, her and her significant other, they walk into a brand new house, a mile home. It's been tested over time. She walks in the kitchen and guess what she does, James? She opens up the microwave. It's the first number one thing they always do. They open. So whenever you walk in the kitchen in a residential home, uh, what they do is they have that fresh baked cookie smell or the cinnamon or whatever. And, and so it's all psychology. It's all mindset is, you know, and it's any type of selling that goes on. What you said was really well said because you mentioned in one of your comments is really taking care of your people and, and really taking care of them and being aware. And that's so important in any business is really being aware and being a good listener. And obviously with your success, you're a good listener because you have to open up your filter and learn in life and not stop learning. It's one of the things you said, and I agree with you and for everyone out there is continue to grow continue to listen, seek the truth in what someone's telling you because your lens is different than everyone else's lens. Like, you know, James and I can be great friends, but we grew up in different cultures. We grew up differently. We have different type of backgrounds. So his truth and my truth could be different. And so when you have employees or colleagues or people you're doing business with or or personal relationships, Seek the truth in what they're saying and understand because you're not going to understand their lens and viewpoint. And that will go a long way in life as you grow. So let's let's get into a little bit of the economics of TV production groups. Like, give me a brief primer on the economics. Most our audience were asking, like, how does it work? You know, these TV production groups. And aside from creating and sustaining hit shows, James, like, what are the key things you focus on as a CEO to grow your profitability? We have um, an absolute critical access, which is one, ideas. So creation of original ideas, because obviously that's our meat and bones. That's what we live on. And then monetizing. And you do that with fantastic management infrastructure. Because in our industry, we have a lot of egos. Stakes are very high. Things can go horribly wrong. You know, when you're shooting a big show, everything can happen. And, you know, believe me, everything can and everything does happen. Um, so you have to make sure you've got fantastic financiers, fantastic operations people, finance, fantastic lawyers, all of that really complex stuff that goes with running a business. It's got to be razor, razor sharp. So the film industry is somewhat different because you're basically going out seeking finance from a whole host of different places in the hope and the wing and a prayer that maybe your movie might make it. And actually, to be honest, the movie industry is very difficult. Um, it's very uh, compelling um, and intoxicating when you get it right, uh, but it is also a recipe for writing a check and chucking it down the drain. And most movies fail. So it's not a great business model to be in, although it is intoxicating if you're in the creative in- industry. And we do a bit of that. The television sector, and I include in that the streamers and also the new, the new platforms. Um, we've made shows for Facebook Watch and for um, uh, Snapchat and TikTok and elsewhere. All these new platforms, they're all commissioning original content. The business model there is much more attractive 
because basically we come up with ideas, we go and talk to our clients who run these schedules and have budget, and they say to us, well, we either like that idea or we hate it. And, you know, they often say we hate it, but then sometimes they say we love it. And then they give you the money to go away and produce it. The world is changing, though, because with pressures on advertising revenues, and obviously a lot of these channels depend upon subscriptions and things, and people have got less cash in their pocket right now. So increasingly, we're, we're finding the world is becoming more of a co-production environment. And we do a lot of international co-production. So we might get 50%. If it's like a million dollar an hour show, let's say, it could be about science or technology or scripted drama. Um, we will say, look, let's find maybe 30, 40, 50% in the US. We might find 10% in Canada. We might find 10, 15, 20% in the UK. We might find some money in France, Germany, Scandinavia, Australia. We might find seven different partners who want to invest as a co-production. And that's increasingly becoming the model. So as you build a group, for me, sanity is in diversification. I don't ever want to be too reliant on anything. I don't like having all my eggs in one basket. I'm the kind of guy that likes to have breadth. And I also need to get out clause because sometimes things don't work and you've got to know where else you can go. You always want to know what's your exit plan um, from a project primarily, but potentially also a business if it goes horribly wrong. So I've made sure that over the years, and I, and I ran my own company for 10 years, and then I turned it into a group in 2001, 2011, called Argonom. And we went on a, a roll-up journey, and we bought a number of big companies. We bought a big music entertainment business that are huge on MTV. We bought a big science technology company that makes incredible shows about the cosmos and um, ancient mammoths, and they're, they're constantly digging up uh, Egypt. So at the moment, they think they're onto Cleopatra's tomb. <laughs> so that's very different. Then we went out and we set up a joint venture. I like joint ventures because they 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 inspire very um, hungry entrepreneurs. We do a deal, a sort of uh, a shared deal, setting up a company from scratch, and we provide all the infrastructure, and they obviously run all the creators themselves. Uh, and we did that in the current affairs space. We actually broke the Epstein story, and we've got some really big investigations coming down the track, which are very edgy, and I'm, I love a bit of journalism in the mix. We also set up a joint venture in, you know, the crazy world of entertainment, The Masked Singer, you know, the show where celebrities dress up in crazy costumes and you have to guess who they are. I mean, that is totally outside the box. I mean, you couldn't think of anything different from mammoths in a, you know, mammoth bones in a graveyard with David Attenborough and the Masked Singer. But again, this is diversification. And when one thing is a huge hit, something else is probably not working so well or might get cancelled. Our shows, they have, they have a natural cycle. Um, and that, again, is part of this kind of flexible mindset. You accept that something will suddenly appear out of nowhere, a bit like the Masked Singer. It will be a massive hit. And then at some point, it'll get killed. And that's obviously sad when that happens and it's not great, but we are used to it. And we go, OK, right, well, we're already thinking about what's the next, what's going to replace that, what comes after that. And when a certain area stops being popular, like shiny floor entertainment shows may stop being popular at some point. Then we've got a really great line in real estate. We produce House on Sins International, which is on pretty much every night on HGTV. It's a very feel good, very entertaining travel show. And people love it. It's like 10, 10, 30 every night on HGTV. And it's a real appointment to view. And we're filming that show all over the world every day of the week. And, you know, please, please God, that will continue to run for years, but you can never utterly rely on things you, you do have to expect that there will be evolution so what's coming next what's coming down the track so diversification is critical it's so well said i mean in commercial real estate diversification is everything it's it's one of the premise of the funds we do like the alliance medical property fund it will be diverse of 30 40 assets around the united states of different type of medical service tenants in our buildings and so diversification is everything in business and in life it's it's the ability that you have to pivot something's not working okay we have something else in the hopper to do and uh no your 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 realtor show should do really well because people are in, people love real estate people think what i do is extremely sexy james and uh i don't see it because i live it i'm knee deep into it and i've been doing it for a long time but I feel your realtor show, people love the fix and flips. They love, they love the big buildings. They love the excitement because it, the most billionaires are produced through, through commercial real estate and different types of real estate. So 
I agree with you. Diversification is a, is a huge play when it comes to investing. And all of us are investing in something, whether it's people, whether it's buildings, whether it's companies, you name it. There's always an investment going on. You have to be able to manage risk and be flexible and be able to pivot and be aware. And that's why I always encourage people is be a good listener and, and understand, build all your resources. One thing at Alliance that I'm proud of is we're resource rich, which I'm sure you are as well, is to have the resources to tap into to consistently learn and grow. So I have a lot of mentors and coaches from around the world that uh, help me get to this point and continue to grow and, and even work with our employees. So it's so well said, diversification, growth. Uh, open your mind is is everything. You know, as an exec- executive, um, how do you assess which new shows to invest in? And what is the most important criteria when you have to look at new shows? We're always judged on the quality of our creativity. So we spend our life thinking about what's next. What can we come up that's not been done before? or not been done in quite this way before. What's the new twist? The truth is nothing is original. Everything's been done in some way before, but it's the twist. How do you give it a new angle? How do you make it feel fresh and take it from you know a new perspective? So the creativity always comes first, and that comes from people. And it comes from people in an environment where they feel supported, where there's a culture that feels positive and where creative people are, are able to go, you know what, I'm going to try 100 ideas. Maybe 95 of them will be terrible. That's okay. Five of them could be real killer ideas, and one of them might be the next juggernaut hit. So allowing people that space to make mistakes, but also to think outside the box and to really push the envelope, that's absolutely critical. Then, of course, we are very, very mindful of the market, and that's whether that's a new platform, whether it's you know Roku starting to commission original programming or Snapchat deciding, well, actually, they're not going to commission the originals anymore. YouTube changing their opinion on commissioning or Discovery have got some new plans about what they think they want to do, what's their new direction. So we have to be very mindful about the platforms who are obviously our main clients. So we listen very, very carefully and we have extremely close relationships. We talk to them all every week because we want to know, you know, where are you thinking now? How can we help you? How can we get you to where you want to be? So we are a service provider in that regard. Sometimes there is a program where we just have a hunch. We just think this is such a mad idea. I've never considered it before, but it's a great idea. Someone should make it. (laughs) Um, So we do allow a bit of that. And it's important to have some signature work in the mix. To be honest, if we only did that, we would not have a business (laughs) because the crazy ideas, you know, often just never make it. But it's fun for the creative sector. And I want A-listers to work for me. I spend my life attracting the best people on the planet to come and work for us. They could work for a thousand of my competitors. Why do they want to come and work for us, for us, with us? Because they know that we love creativity and we like to take risks. We also know how to leaven that with long-running sustainability. So the bedrock of our business is the long-running shows. We've got a big show called uh, Mistress of the Abandoned. It's on Science Channel. It's a hit show. It has been for many, many years. How Sons International I've told you about. Even the Masked Singer is now in its multiple season. These things, of course, are very, very important. The audience love them. You grow an audience. You have that amazing interactivity with the audience because they love the show and want to be part of it. But you have to mix it up. We throw the odd bomb in, the most extraordinary thing that no one's ever thought of. And you go, wow, that's amazing. And it goes and wins you an award. Awards are important. What's interesting to me is when, when I think about um, how you assess what to risk. And people say, well, what's your criteria, Ben? How do you pick a commercial piece of real estate to invest in? Well, we look at population growth. We look at rents in the marketplace. We look at vacancy rates. We look at credit worthy of tenants, construction, et cetera. We look at probably you know 80 to you know 150 deals a week to find the stuff that we want to acquire. How many shows do you have to review James, on average, a weekly, just to say, hey, this is something we want to explore. Like, what are the metrics look like for the deal flow? Well, as you said, there are um, multiple groups uh, in Argonon. There are nine different companies doing all very different things. And they are talking to literally every single buyer on the planet. And they all have different metrics. And some of them are very open. 
So Discovery, for example, will be very clear about what's working for them and what isn't and what's the demographic and how's it hitting and is it male skewed and other men 40 years old or less and or is it, you know, really hitting the 16 to 24 demographic? You know, so some networks give you lots of information. Most of the streamers give you virtually none. They keep it for themselves. And, you know, that's a business decision. It would be quite useful to know that, but they're not willing to share that. So, so, so be it. All we can judge their success on, of course, is whether things get you know, picked up again and, you know, get a repeat season. Of course, the, the commissioners, the network executives will know exactly what's going on. They just don't reveal it to us, their clients, uh, or their suppliers, rather. There's some data and metrics that we use. And some of the time we are relying on information provided by the client who will say, everything that's big and got cars in it right now is going to be huge on motor trend let's say it's not a particularly big channel but it's very successful a very specific demographic we're producing a car show for them right now they know exactly what their audience love and they tell us that so of course we then go out and look for things like that we're shooting a great show in philadelphia right now with some really big characters and i can't obviously reveal all the detail but i'm very excited about that show um, and i quite often like working through these very tight networks who have a very specific target audience they know exactly what their audience love and we can then come into that and say, okay, well, we're going to give you something else that's a little bit different. It's got an extra twist. We'll give it another, another, an extra dimension. And, and then they buy it and off we go. What's your favorite part about being in the TV industry? I know it's tough. I have some neighbors in Southern California and Orange County where I live. Uh, one of them has to be British and uh, he's in the TV industry. I hear the war stories and I hear, you know, you can get canceled quickly and and people they'll shuffle people in and out and won't even give you a reason and it to me it just sounds like oh my god the risk is crazy we actually had larry namer who started the e-channel uh he he was on my show a while ago and they actually launched him uh yesterday it's a great episode and it was interesting he made a comment he said i said how long have you been in the business and he's a friend he goes yeah i've been in it ben for about 50 years and and uh I can't believe I'm I'm in the I'm still in the business. Like every day I'm wondering like what am I doing in this business? What am I doing? And so what's your favorite part of this industry? It's it's a really tough business. It is shark infested waters, some of it. Yes. You need thick skin, definitely. You need to be willing to take a lot of rejection because a lot of stuff that you may fall in love with, you think it's the best idea that anyone's ever had. Nobody will buy it. This stuff happens. Um but to be honest, um, it is a very vi vibrant, very vital industry. And uh, it is constantly changing and evolving. You know, a few years back, everyone said, cable's dead. Um, no one's going to watch TV anymore. They're all going to be on YouTube. Now, the truth is cable is struggling a bit, but still millions and millions of people around the world watch cable. They also watch YouTube. They also watch TikTok. They go to IMAX and they watch 10-part series on Netflix. And we produce all of those. Our expertise is as storytellers. And, you know, you go back in the history of this world civilization, people have loved sitting around a fire listening to great stories. So our core expertise is something that human beings have done for thousands and thousands of years, whether it's on TikTok today or in an IMAX theater. It doesn't particularly matter to me because they're both valid. They're both great entertainment. So as producers, we want to make sure that we're flexible and you know, young in our minds, and we employ lots of great young people as well to keep the fresh blood coming in, as well as having the expertise of those of us who've been around somewhat longer. So I love being a constant student. I love coming up with creative ideas and listening to people who've got much better ideas than me do that. I love working with A-list talent. I mean, they're A-listers for a reason, because they are brilliant at their job, and it's a privilege to work with them. And we make great money. You know, if you make it in this industry, you can make great money. You know, a lot of people gravitate in business to maybe it's a deal they've done. You know, people say, Ben, what what is Alliance's favorite state to invest in or cities? And Austin, Texas has been a really good city for me throughout my career. I love it there. And the people have been great to us. Is there a TV show that you're personally connected to that is, you know, not to start uh delineating the different shows you've produced and, and have but is there one that's been the most personally satisfying to you in your career okay there's one film that i am very proud of actually um which we produced a few years back and it's called the day the immigrants left 
that's a little contentious. And I did try to sell it. I got Ava Longoria attached to it as talent. Uh huh. And we didn't manage to sell it in the US because it is a little contentious. But don't worry, I'm not going to frighten off your listeners. <laughs> we produced it at 9 p.m., which is prime time on BBC One on a Monday night. Mm-hmm. And the idea was that we were going to go to a small town in Middle England where um, every summer thousands of Eastern Europeans arrive to take all the jobs of local people, as is perceived. So they work in the fields, they work in the factories, they work on the building sites, they work in the restaurants, the bars, the cafes, everywhere. And there is a perception from local people, particularly people who are on welfare, that they're stealing our jobs and making our lives a misery and they should all be kicked out. So we, with BBC, which is very credible, you know, good journalistic, utterly reliable, responsible uh, institution, said, well, let's go and test this phenomenon. Let's take the immigrants out of this town for a week and we'll send them all off on holiday to the beach, which is what we did. And we found 100 people on welfare who we offered good jobs to and said, well, look, you've got a bit of experience in hospitality so you come and work in a restaurant you've got a bit of experience working on a construction site so you come and do a bit of construction you've got experience working on a factory floor can you come and help us pack potatoes you've got experience on a farm can you come and pick asparagus etc so they took all the jobs on day one of the 100 people who we had prepared five people showed up oh wow 95 didn't even show which is disappointing because we'd given them a chance and we wanted them to be successful but only five showed. And of those five, I'm afraid the guy who went into the restaurant didn't know how to lay a table. He didn't know a knife and a fork went side by side. <laughs> um, the guy in the asparagus field, I mean, he picked about, I don't know, half a pound of asparagus and then was too exhausted. So he just basically took off. And the factory floor, we had to have a Portuguese um, foreman running the packing line. And he turned the conveyor belt right down super, super slow so that our two guys could try and keep up. And, he, and they were basically saying, Look, this is really not fair. You cranked it up. You made it go so fast. We can't keep up. And the Portuguese foreman said, indeed, the boss of that factory said, if we ran the conveyor belt this slow, we would be able to do that. For sure. So uh-huh. the corollary of all of that, we worked with an economist, was that actually these, these Eastern Europeans, they come in, they've got an amazing work ethic. Mm-hmm. They pay all of their taxes. And all of the businesses we interviewed in that town said, if we had to rely on people on welfare, we wish them well, but we couldn't hire them because we'd have to close down. So it was putting an argument in a very clear, and it was quite fun. I mean, there's quite a lot of laughs, actually, this show. But it was put in a very simple way that actually we do need immigration. Immigration is really important. And, you know, a lot of these people do work very hard. They, they're quite often, you know, sending money back to Lithuania and, and um, Estonia and Poland and goodness knows where else they came, came from. And they're paying for fees to study law or fees to become a doctor. But they would come, they would come to the UK to work briefly and, and they do a great job and our factories and so on could function. Now, of course, there is one other piece in that puzzle, which, of course, since then we've had Brexit. And Brexit has stopped all the Europeans coming into the UK. So now we've got a massive problem. We've got thousands of jobs that need to be done. And previously, we had a lot of people who were willing to do those jobs. And um, we're now struggling to find people to do the work. And there's, you know, this summer there were strawberries rotting in the fields because no one was willing to go and pick the strawberries. And there were still lots of people on welfare but they are not willing or able to do that work. So it's contentious, it's political, and of course there are both sides of that argument. We made very clear that we wanted to just examine this contentious issue in a fun and entertaining way, and we got tens of millions of people watching that show. So uh-huh. we really fired up a debate about, you know, well, what do we really think about immigration? You know, We might think it's horrendous, but actually some of these people coming to our country are really vital, and they do a, a lot of good for us. So I like that because it was entertaining, but also it had a few kind of controversial points which got people thinking. Do you think it's interesting the just human nature and the mind of like you look at the mass singer? Okay. And by the way, I am not a big TV watcher. Okay. I don't I don't watch shows. I don't have time. And I think I'm gonna have to go back and watch this show, The Mass Singer, because now you got me interested. I've seen clips. So isn't it interesting that people want that mystery? of who's singing and the, you rip off the mask and, and people get into it. Are you amazed by just the human mind and some of the, the craziness of, of what people get entertained by 
just to relieve stress and kind of just get to kind of step away from their daily lives? We were very lucky that this show, uh, it popped up actually in South Korea, first of all, and we picked it up very early on before it was a big international hit. And um, we picked it up for a few thousand dollars. And that's one of the, one of my team spent time, you know, digging around international markets, looking for curiosities. And we tried to sell it and everybody said, no, this is too weird. And then we said, you know what, Fox has just picked it up. Let's see what happens to Fox. And Fox turned it into this massive overnight hit. It was the biggest launch of any show in 10 years. At which point everybody in the UK wanted it. And suddenly we had a sort of massive auction and the price went up, which is obviously good. Um, but it was interesting to see. Um, it happened, of course, and we, st- we first started producing it just as COVID came around. I mean, you know, God works in mysterious ways. There we were, everybody shut down wearing masks, producing this crazy entertainment format with celebrities wearing masks. I mean, the timing was immaculate. Um, why do people love it? Well, there's not much family viewing anywhere right now. There's not that that many shows that mum and dad can sit down and really enjoy it, and the kids will love it too. And of course, mum and dad know who the celebs are, so they can kind of realistically take a guess. The kids, they don't even know who the celebrities are, and that really doesn't matter. They just love the costumes and the singing and the whole performance. But it beca- it's become a real phenomenon because it's such warm-hearted, feel-good family entertainment. And I think what's so clever at the heart of that format is it's a guessing game. People love to play games. It's very diverting. You know, you're sitting there with your family, you're all laughing, you know, this one thinks it's that one, that one thinks it's other. It's funny. The panel are great celebs. There's a lot of, com- there's a lot of comedy. Um, and yeah, we absolutely, in our world, we need escape routes. You know, the world is a tough place. Play Playtime is critical. I, you know, really believe strongly in life-work balance. I work extremely hard and I play hard. It's very important. As you know, there's an ongoing strike in Hollywood at the moment. Um, how is that affecting you, or does it affect you at all? Yeah, it's very, very painful for a lot mm-hmm. of people because mm-hmm. there are a lot of people out there who are struggling, and a lot mm-hmm. of people have not got any work and they've got no money, and that is appalling. Very, very talented people. And it's painful on both sides, both for the networks and all of the freelancers and the workers. So I really, really hope that they will find a solution. And I'm sure they will eventually, but it is very painful. And, you know, to your point earlier about, you know, what is one of the most difficult things in my industry is, yeah, it can be brutal. And there are times when shows get cancelled or a show just doesn't work. It might be an incredible show, but for some reason it doesn't get through. And I've had friends who have, you know, put everything for some years into a project and it totally bombs and they're devastated because it's their baby and their baby is a complete, you know, dead in the water. It's horrible, really, really tough. So, um, so yeah, the upsides are amazing, but you have to accept that there's always a downside as well. And, and that is bad news. Has there been in any of your shows or any of your productions where an actor or an actress comes in and you're like, eh, they're not a good fit. And they just go on to stardom. And you're like, oh, we made a mistake there. Do you have any of those stories to share? Or is there one person in particular that you could laugh about? You're like, oh, we totally misread that one. Um, no, but I, I couldn't I couldn't possibly name names. But I will tell you one thing. Um, we did a we did a movie that it was a it's kind of horror thriller. Uh-huh. And, it, and it was about a woman living in the middle of the countryside whose husband has left her and uh, she's really struggling and she's down on down on her assets and she's living on a farm that's crumbling around her ears. And there's a whole kind of creepy, it's called The Holding. There's a whole creepy story that unfolds. On the first day of shooting, the actor, the woman, uh, the lead actor arrives and she has had giant collagen put into her lips, bee sting, bee stung lips. So she has got these enormous bee stung lips that make her look like a Hollywood adult movie star. And she's supposed to be a poverty stricken single mum who's been abandoned by her husband living in the countryside with nothing. And she'd already been hired. The contracts were signed. There was nothing we could do. So we had to shoot the whole movie with this actor (laughs) with the most incredible cosmetic surgery that frankly nobody in that position could afford. Uh, That's um, unbelievable. So before we wrap up, is there anything about your newly launched book or other ventures you're involved in you want to share with our audience? Um, Well, simply, obviously, I really love feedback. And I do hope that if people feel inspired, they might pick the book up. It's available on Amazon, on Goodreads, in bookstores. It's called The Flexible Method. 
Um, and I would love feedback. You know, I'm on LinkedIn. I really like it when people read the book and they comment and they suggest things. It is a book that I've written to have long, uh, longevity. You know, so if people have got great ideas or people have stories they want to tell me, I would love that. Please feedback. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to wrap up with our three questions. Are you ready, James? Okay. All right. Well, in Laguna Beach, we have a couch. And I would say, James, lay down, kick off your shoes, relax. Uh, how old are you now? I'm 58. Okay. You're 58. Go back to when you were 16 years old. Uh, growing up, you've had tremendous success. Uh, you're well-educated. And you can go back and talk to yourself when you're 16 years old. What advice or what would you share with yourself now, knowing what you know now with your younger self to help get that younger version of James Burstall to this point? If you really want it, you can have it. Well said. Is that it? Anything else? Expand on that? or? I, I mean, I, I, I spend a lot of time with the next generation. Obviously, I've got lots of... Uh, young uh, children and um, nephews and nieces and godchildren in my life. And I always encourage them that if they feel passionately about something, mm -hmm. obviously don't hurt yourself or hurt anybody else. But if you really feel strongly about something, you must, must go for it. And if you believe in it and you work hard, you can have it. So well said. So it's our last day on earth. God forbid. It's just me and you. It's our last meal together. Your choice, James. What are we eating and what are we drinking? <laughs> okay, well, it has to be Chateau Neuf du Pape, uh, which is the wonderful Southern French yes. a classic red wine. I'm sure you one know. My, one of my favorite wines. I love it's it. A big, beefy reds, which yes. I absolutely love. My grandfather was French, actually. Oh, uh, okay. I don't know if you know this. I'm a wino. I collect wine. So uh, that's, that's, that's a great, great so area. It would be Chateau Neuf du Pape, and it would be a stick or poivre. So a really good fillet of beef with a, pep a very, very punchy pepper sauce. Oh, I love that. What, do we have dessert with that meal? <laughs> uh, God, what would the dessert be? Well, I don't, I, to be honest, I would definitely uh, want a cheese plate first. Oh, yeah. Um, the yeah. French do. And, 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 fruit. French and we need fruit. Oh, yeah. Maybe, yes, at the end, yeah. <laughs> so in our studio in Lagoon Beach, and by the way, if you are ever in town, Please stop by. We'd love to have you in studio. I've got fantastic. friends in the gym, so I come there a lot. I'd oh, love, to, fantastic. Love, to, love to grab a meal with you. And it won't be our last day on earth. And <laughs> so in our studio, we have a black door, James, and we have a grand piano. We have a drum set and we have electrical and acoustical guitars as well in our studio. And you're in studio with me and we can pick any musician or band to walk through that black door and play us a song. Now, James, they could be living or deceased, and it's your choice. Who would you want to walk through that door, and what song would they be playing us? Well, having just seen, fairly recently seen the movie, and I have to admit, I am an Elvis fan. Oh. And I understand now for the first time why he was such an important figure. I didn't mm -hmm. quite get it. I knew he was a great musician, but I didn't quite understand why. And he pushed those boundaries. And oh, yeah. some people hated him. Some people were threatened by him. But you know what? He believed in that incredible music, much of which came from the black community. Mm -hmm. And he took it and he turned it, he converted it into something amazing that appealed to a huge global audience. And the song would have to be Suspicious Mind. Because that is such an amazing, amazing, iconic number. Ah, uh, what a great choice. And that's a great song. Well, thank you for joining us. If you are interested in listening to more episodes on the I Own It show, drop, kick that right hand button and click subscribe. Click the like button as much as you can, because we want to make this content. And as I say in the ether, let it go viral. To follow me, go to benreinberg.com. You can follow me on all different social media platforms. And if you are interested in investing in commercial real estate on a passive basis, look no further. Look to the leaders. Go to alliancecgc.com. We are the leaders in investing in commercial real estate in the United States. Feel free to log on and look at our brand new fund, the Alliance Medical Property Fund. And as I say, the human body is never going out of style. 
James Burstall, thank you so much for joining us. What a privilege and hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the I Own It podcast with Ben Reinberg. To hear our past episodes and connect with Ben, visit benreinberg.com.